Hello everyone, Bridget Spackman here, and I am so excited to be here with all of you this evening. So I know that it's the end of the year for you guys and you're exhausted, you're tired, and it's a real struggle to even try to wake up and go to school every single morning. And I wanna thank you for being here on this live chat because I know it's hard to think about anything that is school related right now. I mean, getting up in the mornings, looking at things for next year, it's just exhausting. And so thank you for the start, to, for watching this video uh, and getting some ideas on how you can start looking to better yourself next year so you're not as overwhelmed. I wanna be that person that help, helps guide you in that process. So welcome. Today in this live chat, uh, we are going to be going over unpacking anchor standards. And this is gonna be the last free anchor standard that I'm going on uh, YouTube with. So today is going to be all about informational. So get excited. I love informational. Um, and we're going to be looking at anchor seven this evening. So hello, everyone. And I'm seeing you guys over there in the chat. I see Lola, my girl's always here. Leslie, hello, Juliana. And then Alicia, thank you so very much for the, the sweet comment. It does really make me feel <laughs> So much better. Um, I always worried about, sorry, dog. I always worried about putting my book out there in the world and then not kind of getting a response. So thank you. I appreciate the response on the book and how it's, how you are enjoying it and that there is some really good information in there. Um, Joanna, I see you in there, girl. Hello and welcome everyone. Okay, so here's the thing. I know that it's the end of the year and already thinking about next year and really trying to figure out how can I make this next year easier. Unpacking anchor standards is going to be the thing. Um, I know that I've had many conversations with Leslie about how important it is to truly be a master of your content. When you know your standards front, back, side to side, when you really, really have them, it's going to be so much easier to plan out your lessons, to know what you're going to be doing, to be strategic in your teaching, and to not feel so overwhelmed. When you have that really good understanding of your standards, everything just starts to feel like better. It's so much smoother and you will find yourself feeling less stressed. So in this anchor standards video that we are doing today, I'm going to be unpacking um, informational anchor standard seven, and we're going to be looking at um, the vertical alignment between fourth through sixth grade. We're also going to look at learning targets so that we can build a really nice progression for our lessons because we don't want to just give them the whole chicken. We want to cut it up into little bite size to make it easier <laughs> to take in. Um, but then we're also going to look at some mentor text and I have some really good activities for you guys today. Now you're probably wondering, Bridget, why in the world are you doing anchor like seven right now. Like you started with literature one last week. I thought you were going to go into one this week. I have really good reasons. I promise. If you look at informational and literature anchor one, they're going to be very, very similar. In fact, I think they're pretty much identical. How we approach them is going to just look just a tiny bit different because when we know that we approach genres differently, we look at them with a different lens. Um, but I'm going to save all of that for the community. Now, I have to tell you guys, I mentioned that this video is going to be the last free anchor video that I have up on my YouTube channel. So all of the other anchors, this is informational literature and also for writing is going to be over on my bridging literacy community. So we've been doing some revamping and some changing and I've heard some different requests and we've gone back to doing the monthlies. Now I have a lot of things planned for the community and I am excited to be able to go back to this monthly piece where so you can opt in and then you're going to receive all of the videos, resources, mentor text. You will have a list of everything that you might need. Um, you'll have any of the templates that I create uh, and then all of the graphic organizers that go along with it for each of the different anchor standards that I go through and break down. Now, I will tell you guys that I also am doing um, Q&A sessions with my Bridging Literacy community. We're going to do that in our private Facebook group um, where you have an opportunity to ask questions you will have an opportunity to also request different types of videos that will allow you to, you know, dig a little bit deeper into how can I make teaching literacy so much easier? Because let's just be honest with ourselves, 
teaching literacy is not the easiest of things to do. <laughs> Um, so I want to be able to help you guys to make it so much smoother. Um, I know that bridging literacy is just this entire idea and design for how do we, um, approach reading and writing instruction together, united in one kind of front versus keeping them as separate entities. When we take everything and we separate them, kids are not able to make connections. And so bridging literacy really looks at how to make those connections. And in order to do that, even as teachers, again, it goes back to really knowing your content. So I'm excited to be able to break down some of these barriers and that content to be able to assist you guys through all of these processes. Okay, so um, I just wanted to say hello and welcome. And also, I really wanna know, are you out of school? Are you in school? How are you doing? Let's just talk about how we're feeling and doing right now. Um, I gotta be honest, guys, last week was rough. <laughs> <laughs> it was not an easy week for me. Um, I feel like my kids are starting to get super sassy and they're starting to like become very, very chatty. Um, and the work ethic has just gone way downhill, which I cannot blame them, to be honest. I mean, we're all feeling the summer like we're ready for it, right? It, I get it. I totally understand. Um, so I have this is my last full week and then we'll have a three day weekend with Memorial Day and then um, it'll be like three and a half days because the Friday, June 4th is going to be um, just a half day with our students. So 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 close eight and a half days with my kids i can't believe it it's really kind of quick and sudden but it's also really sad that they're going to be leaving me i love this cohort of students they've been fantastic i'm very blessed and lucky that i get to keep them next year but we're going to go back to you know mac team so it's not going to be quite the same um, because they're going to have you know the other fourth and fifth graders that are going to be coming in and they're going to be our 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 big people. There are sixth graders, which is kind of crazy to think about. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and jump on in to our slides. So let me tell you that you are in the right place if you are really struggling with the how and the what of teaching literacy. I get it. I feel you. I was there not that long ago, it seems like. Um, understanding literacy and really being able to kind of pull everything apart and say, well, what is what does this look like? How am I supposed to be teaching this? Or, you know, what are some of the strategies and methods and what are the good texts that I could be using? I understand you. <laughs> We're going to be talking all about that with informational anchor seven tonight. You're also in the right place if you really want to understand how to build learning targets and be strategic with your lessons. Guys, I love learning targets. I've been using them for the nine years that I have been teaching going on now 10 years. I cannot believe it. Um, and learning targets have really allowed me to focus my lessons, focus what my students are doing, and making sure that I am following this progression so that I don't kind of become a stray dog. <laughs> I'm not straying <laughs> too much here. Uh, you are also in the right place if you're struggling to really understand what is expected of your students. Time and time again, understanding what my kids are supposed to be doing in writing was so hard. <laughs> These standards are incredibly broad and to be able to understand the difference between those grade levels, um, it's important that we know that because then it allows us to understand, well, what's the expectation at the very end of this lesson or unit? So we're going to chat about that as well. Um, you are also in the right place if you struggle to really find text activities to be able to support you. I will say, guys, like it's easy to engage kids in math. It's easy to engage kids in science and social studies because you could do all of these different activities. I always felt as though I struggled to engage my kids in reading. They have to read. They have to write. So how do I make that fun? How do I make that interesting? I have some really good activities for you today. Now, reminder, the community for this like anchor series that I'm going to be doing this summer is closing. Um, actually on June the 4th, my last day of school, I did that on purpose. <laughs> It's going to be closing at 11.59, so I highly recommend you guys jump into the community. Go ahead, join monthly. Um, I promise you it's going to be filled with a lot, a lot of information. Okay, let's go ahead and jump on in. So what are anchor standards? Really, it's these college and career readiness standards that we say, okay, 
this is what kids need to be able to know and do in order to become really good citizens. Like they, they, this is what they need to be ready for college or for the job force, whatever it may be. This is just kind of the expectation for them. So these are very, very broad standards. And then I almost kind of think of it like an umbrella. So you have this really big, broad standard, and then it's broken down into these smaller standards that are scaffolded among the grade levels. Now, the hard thing is, is that the language is just sometimes a little bit tricky to really understand the difference between them. Um, so we're going to go over all of these. Now we have them in reading, they have them in writing, speaking, listening, and also in language. Uh, we are really going to focus on the reading, writing, and uh, um, the for the literature and the informational with bridging literacy. So when we look at informational anchor seven, this is going to be that big umbrella. Okay, here's how it's read. Integrate and evaluate content presented in diverse media and formats, including visual and quantitatively as well as in words. That is like gibberish to me. It's like, but what does that mean? <laughs> how does this like change for each of these grade levels because right now I feel like they're speaking a different language <laughs> so what has happened is over the course of my now five years being at the school that I am at and really working with fourth fifth and sixth graders I really had it to get really good at my standards because I needed to know what was the difference between these three grade levels because I was teaching all three grades and so anchor standards became my best friends. Now I want to talk to you and show you um, the vertical alignment here because when we're looking at the vertical alignment we're able to kind of see okay where are the kids coming in at where should they be leaving at and when we can kind of see that progression among them it makes it so much easier to understand what you should be doing as a teacher. Um, I often say this that I feel as though the anchor standards can be so tricky even when you're looking at your own specific grade level because I can interpret it one way and then the teacher down the hall can interpret it in a totally different way and so then everybody's kind of getting different types of instruction. So I might be summarizing using plot and another teacher might be summarizing with the somebody wanted but so then type of situation like graphic organizer and not to say it's not wrong but it's to help to build a little bit more consistency we look at those vertical alignment to help build that consistency piece so let's go ahead and we're going to start looking at fourth fifth and sixth and this is because of the ones i'm really good at now if you're a third grade teacher don't leave me <laughs> I am going to share the third grade standard and we're actually going to talk about it um, just a little. So I want to let you all know that in third grade, okay, here's how the third grade standard reads. Use information gained from illustrations, meaning like maps and photographs and the words in the text to demonstrate understanding of the text. Now, I love that they put this in here because they put the uh, where, when, why, how, and the key events occur. Um, so those are kind of the questions that you're focusing on with your third graders. So if we're really looking at just being able to pull information out of these text features, essentially, because that's what it is, it's just text features, they're pulling information out of these text features and also the text to really just be able to answer these W questions. Um, basic just questions about do you early understand the text that you're reading right now so in fourth grade it starts to end up changing now we go to interpreting information that's presented visually orally or quantitatively so in charts graphs diagrams uh, timelines animations or interactive elements um, and they also have to be able to explain how the information contributes to an understanding of the text in which it appears again i feel like it's really 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 wordy and we're going to look at how we can start breaking some of these down but i want to also present you with the next grade levels so let's kind of start looking at the differences or listening to those differences as we move along so here's what fifth grade reads fifth grade says draw information from multiple print or digital sources demonstrating the ability to locate an answer to a question quickly or to solve a problem efficiently okay so not as wordy as the fourth grade version but you can already start to kind of see some of the differences between them now let's look at sixth grade here's what sixth grade says 
integrate information that's presented in different media or formats visually or quantitatively. They say those words quite a bit, so I'm assuming that it's really important. As well as words to develop a coherent understanding of a topic or issue. So when we're looking at all of these, how do we start to really break them down so that we can under so that we can kind of see the differences between them? Well, there's an approach that I have taken for multiple years and I start to look for the verbs, the nouns, and the adverbial phrases. So here are going to be some of them that we can see. Let's look at our uh, verbs first, because I like to look at the verbs first. So here are the verbs. So if we look at the verbs from fourth, fifth, and sixth grade, for fourth grade, we have interpret and explain. So they're going to have to look at some sort of information and be able to say, well, here's what this information is trying to tell me. So a lot of that is going to be with the graphs, the diagrams, um, which is really, really important. In fifth grade, we're then starting to draw information from it. We're demonstrating and the ability to be able to locate and solve problems, right? Locate information and solve these problems. And then in sixth grade, we're integrating and developing. So these are the things that your students need to be doing with this information, okay? So let's look to see what they're doing it with. And we're gonna look at the nouns. So here are the nouns. The nouns we have for fourth grade are information, charts, graphs, animations, web pages, pretty basic. I think of it as text features and text. For fifth grade, it says digital sources, print, information, um, and I see like the answer that's in there, a problem that's also in there. And then in sixth grade, we have information, media, and then words. So it seems as though we're going from these text features and we're gradually starting to build in more of this um, video formats of where we can try to pull information. So I like to think of the basic text features that you find in the text, but then it starts to kind of grow where they want students to be able to look at multiple sources, multiple formats of information and being able to pull it from. So I think of things like YouTube, um, I think of like discovery education, I think of any sort of web pages that you can find, video formats, uh, graphs, any sort of interactive um, sites are really good and I have one that I love and I will share it with you guys in just a little bit. So now that we've looked at that, let's now look at the adverbial phrases. Adverbial phrases is basically saying like the how are you going to be doing things with. Um, it's an uh, adjective for your verbs, essentially. So here's what fourth grade has. We're doing this with visually or uh, orally or quantitatively, and we're looking at the how of being able to pull this information out. For fifth grade, we wanna be able to do this quickly and efficiently, which is gonna play a lot into the activities that we're gonna be doing. And I will tell you guys, I kinda cheat just a little bit, um, and I will share that in just a minute. But in sixth grade, they're looking at um, being able to do something as well as be able to pull it out of words. So you're not only wanting to look at the media formats, but you're also at the exact same time doing this with the text that you're reading. So they're having to use multiple sources in this situation. Um, so here's what I want to do. And I did this last week and you guys were raving about it. And it was basically, I need to see check in my chat over here, where I demonstrate and I showed you guys the differences between what these look like. And this is gonna be where I cheat just a little bit. So let me kind of move my screens here. Um, I'm gonna show you guys the differences between what this looks like for fourth, fifth, and sixth grade. So um, going back to fourth grade, so in fourth grade, it's all about interpreting information um, and really saying, well, how does this text feature contribute to what I'm reading here? Like, why did the author decide to include this text feature in the first place? Oh, 
one of my favorite questions to be asked my students. I still ask my fifth graders that. I will probably also ask my sixth graders that. Like, it's just a great question to constantly go back to over and over and over again. You want to talk higher level thinking skills there. You ask them, but why did the author include this text feature and not something totally different? Because there's a purpose, there's a reason for everything, and especially for why authors are choosing certain text features that they're including in their text. So let's go ahead and I'm gonna show you guys um, a response that would be typical for one of my fourth graders. Okay, so we're looking at this response and it says, how do the videos help you understand the meaning in the nature's mystery? So I want to show you guys um, and bear with me for just a second. I'm going to show you guys this one website that I love. Um, it's a National Geographic site. It's one that I have used with my students before, um, actually multiple times, and it's one that I've actually shared on social media. So it's in nationalgeographic.org, um, and I'm gonna actually paste this into the chat because I did not tell Trent about this one. So I pasted that, that um, URL in the chat so that you guys can see it. But what happens is basically you can go to this site and they have these free digital, um, magazines that you can have your kids do. So here's one that I have used with my students. You can go to view issue. You'll click on the English digital magazine. It also comes in Spanish. Um, and then you're able to kind of click through it. And so my students will, I will just give them the link and then they will be able to go and see these. So um, I want to give you some context for this one here, but in the, there's a nature's mystery one that I've used before with my students, which is really cool because I like all of the mysterious things that are out there. Um, and they will click through and they will read it. And some of this is interactive. And so they slide down, the pictures will pop up. There will be things, sometimes they'll have quizzes and um, different activities that they can do on it. And this one also has videos, which I really love. So you guys can see there, look at that little fish. Isn't it so cute? It's a little puffer fish. Um, you can see the puffer fish there in that video. And then they have several other ones. So in this um, for this little question here, I said, how did the videos help you understand the meaning of the text in nature's mysteries? Like, what is it? How does that really help kind of support what the author is being able to say? And so here's kind of what I wrote up. In the nonfiction text in nature's mysteries, the video of the puffer fish helps to explain how the shapes are being created. The video shows how the fish flaps its fins <laughs> at the bottom of the ocean, creating these shapes. The text further explains why the male puffer fish creates these circles. The videos help the reader to gain a better understanding of how the circles are made. So it really does kind of give you a really nice visual, which a lot of us really enjoy those visuals. I personally enjoy, enjoy those visuals there. But it's all about explaining how it contributes to what you're reading in the text. Now, Here's the thing where I said I cheat, just to I kind of go a little bit above and beyond. Because with my fifth graders, if we remember back to that uh, standard, that anchor standard for fifth grade, it says it wants you to be able to locate information quickly and efficiently to be able to solve a problem. Um, and so typically, the activities that I'll share are going to be some that will just kind of help them pull that information really, really quick. Now. I take it a little bit further and I want my students to be able to use both the images and also the text to be able to support what it is that they're thinking about that that text overall. So in this one it says what mystery is discussed in the section something fishy and how was it explained okay so what mystery was discussed how was it explained so here my students would have to use uh, both the text and the media that came along with it because I wanted them to use multiple sources of information to support what they were saying is happening in the text. Now, this is a sixth grade standard where you're integrating both the words and the media to, to articulate your understanding of the text, but I still have my fifth graders do it because it's not an easy skill and I want my students to have plenty of practice with this. Now, am I going to say that they are going to fail this automatically? No, because that's not how their standard reads. So if they do this and they don't do a great job, it's okay. At least we're trying and we're moving and I'm trying to get them to think above and beyond 
understand and to articulate their thinking and writing. Um, but I'm not necessarily going to, you know, mark them as failure <laughs> on this one. Um, plus fail just stands for first attempt in learning. So it doesn't really count. Um, so I'm not going to expect them to have this mastered. I just want to be able to provide them with um, a little bit of experience before we go into sixth grade. So here's kind of the answer for it. It's in the article Nature's Mystery. The author discusses three different myster mysteries in nature. In the section titled Something Fishy, a, d a diver discovered circle shapes that were found on the ocean floor. After constant observation, a diver caught a male puffer fish that would flap its fins at the bottom by creating shapes. Shapes. The video in the article also shows how the male puffer fish which place shells around the circle. I said that word weird. The divers realized that the purpose of the male puffer fish uh, creating these shapes was to attract a female puffer fish to lay her eggs. This leads the reader to understand how the male puffer fish would attract the female um, for reproduction. Okay, so using both the text and also the videos to be able to support my understanding of the topic or the issue at hand here. Again, it's not necessarily what fifth grade needs to be doing as far as writing it. They're just trying to pull information out quickly, but I'll show you some activities for that in just a little bit. So now you can really see the differences, even in the questionings that you're going to provide, because this is not going to be the same type of questions. Here, it's all about how are the text features really helping you to understand it? How is it supporting the text? Here it's, I want to know what you know about this topic and I want you to pull multiple sources from it to, to help me understand that you get this. Like you have to prove your thinking here, right? So two different types of questionings that are going to be happening and then also two di very different types of responses that are going to be happening with our students. Okay, so I want to check in with everybody and I'm going to take a sip of water. How about that? Leslie says tomorrow is um, field day and it's going to be 90 degrees. Whew. I feel like you should get this little device that Trent was telling me about, apparently. <laughs> it's a bracelet. Guys, I have all these bracelet things that I want to get. But uh, he was telling me that it's a, br a bracelet. And you know that feeling when you're really hot and you're in bed and you have all the covers on you, but then you stick your feet out <laughs> at the very end of it and it just makes you feel so good? That's the way this bracelet makes you feel. So I feel oh, like... That's the marketing. That's the marketing. I don't have the bracelet. I want the bracelet, but I don't have it. <laughs> $300 bracelet. Oh, that's expensive. Yeah. Maybe I don't want that. Uh, but I just thought about that. Leslie, I feel like that's what you need. Just take a bottle and just spritz yourself every once in a while. Um, okay, so let's go ahead and move on to the next part. So we understand the difference between fourth, fifth, and sixth grade, right? That's kind of the goal here, is understanding the difference between those three grade levels. Um, you don't want to double dip too much. You don't want to have to, re you're not reteaching the things that were happening in the next grade level. So how do we really work to build our lesson so that we're giving them strategic, they're focused, but they're also kind of moving us forward into the standards that we are expected to teach. And I get it. A lot of us are probably like, oh, but they forget everything and I have to reteach it all. I get you. And this is where I'm going to show you what I do with my learning targets to help me with that issue. So here's what we do. We use learning targets. And these are really just going to be student language. They're concrete. They're focused on the learning that's occurring within the classroom. And so when we think about learning targets, one of the first things that I like to say is that it really helps to scaffold the lesson. Um, it allows me to build out, build it so that I'm not starting with the hardest concept. I'm starting with something small and I'm able to kind of build from there. It really helps me to identify where my students are kind of missing. What are they not getting? Because if you start with the hardest thing, well, I mean, it could be multiple things, right? Um, building learning targets really helps me to focus in on where my students are struggling. But it also aids in developing a very strategic lesson. When you have a very clear focus, 
the lesson is going to be much more focused. Um, I also still find, because I am not perfect, let's just be honest, <laughs> but I have days where if I don't use my learning target to help build my lesson, I feel like my lesson's just kind of all over the place. Um, and not to say that I don't think that they're not great. They're still good lessons. I feel like there's still good learning that's happening there. But when I'm very strategic and I have a very like focused learning target, Oh, it's such a good feeling because I know what's expected of me. The students know what's expected of them. And I feel like we just kind of get to that point so much quicker. It also helps to state and make aware exactly what's going to be expected um, to take place as far as the learning that's happening. When kids know what they're supposed, it's not like they really want to, but when they really do know what's happening, Guys, it's such a game changer. It changes everything. But here's the thing, and I will say this over and over and over again. You cannot just say or paste that I can statement on the board and then forget about it. You have to keep using it over and over and over again. I probably repeat that learning target or have my students repeat it to one another or say it to themselves at least a good six times within a lesson. Now, I just kind of work it in because in the beginning, I'll read it, they'll read it, they'll kind of share it, what they think that means. And then in the middle, I'll say, well, why are we doing this? And then the kids will repeat that over and over to me. So it's a very like strategic and I'm constantly building that in so that they know what they're expected to do. So these learning targets are gonna be very short um, statements that are written in like student-friendly language. Now. I like to use the I can. You don't necessarily have to use I can. You can say students will, um, or I will, or I can, or it can just start with the, you know, it can just state the objective right then and there. But I personally like the I can statements. I've used them for a very long time. But it's also gonna describe that learning that is occurring. It's not meant to be, what are we doing today? It's not a, you will create a poster on, you know, the puffer fish. That's not what it's there for. What's the learning that's happening? Not necessarily what the kids are doing. You're not saying you're gonna sort between main idea and key details. No, um, you can. I can understand the differences or I can explain the differences between a main idea and key details. And how are they doing that? They're doing that through the process of a sort. Um, but it's just the very broad, here's the learning that's occurring with my kids. And then, Again, it should be discussed over and over. You're like a broken record at this state. Um, and the more you push yourself to say it over and over again, it's gonna become more natural for you and then make it more natural for your students in return. So let's look at Anchor 7 for informational and as far as the learning targets for this. So there are three learning targets that I have for fourth grade. And so the first one you're going to see that it's identifying and defining the purpose between a text, um, the text features. So it's understanding text features and purpose. Now here's the thing. I will say it is not a hill that I'm going to try to die on <laughs> when it comes to, do you know the name of that text feature? Mm -mm. I don't die on that hill, okay? Now, the hill that I do die on is, do you understand the purpose of that text feature? Do you know what's the information that you're supposed to be getting from it? You don't need to remember that it's a caption or that it's an illustration or it's a photograph or it's a diagram. I don't care about all of that. To me, that's not important. To me, what's important is that they understand the information that they're trying to pull out of it. Vocabulary, it's like, I'm not, I, we don't even need to do all that but purpose is important. Now you're gonna notice that the anchor standard does not have anything about that, but here's why I do that. Because for me, in order for them to be able to like interpret information, they need to know the purpose of it. And so I know that in third grade that they were hitting like text features and purpose and what it is. I know that they're doing that. So what I wanted to do was go ahead and start with a learning target that came from the previous grade. And so you're gonna kind of see this repetition between fourth, fifth, and sixth grade as we move along. And so then from that first one, we're gonna to go to the second one, which was interpreting the information that you gain from the text feature. So now that you know the purpose, well, what's the information that you're pulling from that text feature? Just tell me what it is. 
And then finally, um, you're looking at how it really contributes to the text. And that's that whole question of, but why did the author decide to include this diagram here in this section? And so I have some really fun activities that I do with my kids. They're my favorites. I have, I'm going to say that a lot probably, sorry. Um, okay, so that's the broken down learning targets for fourth grade. Let's look at how it changes to fifth grade. For fifth grade, we have three learning targets. And the first one, it's going to sound very familiar. Um, I can interpret information gained from a text feature within an informational text. Hmm, where do you see that one at, fourth grade? So we're kind of pulling from fourth grade. I'm not starting with the lowest thing because that's not my goal. My goal is to not reteach all of fourth grade and then re -te like teach all of fifth grade. If you're doing that, you got to stop. Um, kids will slowly remember. And there are other ways that you can like give them little bits of information that they forget without having to reteach and waste your entire lessons. So this way you're getting through all of the content in a year without feeling like you're rushing at the end of the year and you're just kind of shoving everything down their throats okay so I start with one from the previous year then I move on to the next one which is I can explain how the text features contribute to the understanding of the text okay again still something that's really important so you're saying but Bridget that's something that you're doing in fourth grade absolutely because in fifth grade or third grade they're not having that conversation okay so it's important that I have another year of that conversation because kids who didn't get it in fourth grade are hopefully gonna get it in fifth grade and you're gonna see a lot of similarities between fifth and sixth so I don't feel bad having two learning targets that are similar to what I'm doing in fourth grade. Does that make sense? Um, and then the final learning target is going to be drawing information to answer or solve a problem. So answer a question or solve that problem. Um, now let's look at what sixth grade says. I can draw that information from the text and text features on a topic or issue and then I can use evidence of both the text and media to demonstrate my understanding on a topic or an issue an issue so again I pulled one from fifth grade that I felt as though that I really needed to make sure that I was hitting and then I added this this last one in that's pretty basic for the most part but it's still gonna tie in a lot of the skills that we were doing from fifth grade into the sixth grade standard does that make sense okay any questions so far how are we doing guys everybody still with me Now I'm going to pause really quick and I'm going to tell you guys that with these uh, anchor standards and bridging literacy community because I do see that I have a lot of my community members that are in here. So I am going to be posting these up very soon. I'm waiting to be able to do like a community announcement on Facebook. We're all going to get together. We're going to welcome all of the new members, which by the way, we did get quite a few new members and I'm very excited to have them all aboard of the community. It's going to be great. Uh, but these videos are going to be broken down. So you're going to have these videos in little bite sizes instead of having an entire you know hour of just seeing Bridget talk over and over and over again um, but if you're more focused and you want to say okay today I just want to really understand and interpret this standard you're gonna be able to click on that video um, and now when we start getting into like the mentor text and the activities those are gonna be two different videos as well so then that way it's gonna be easier for you to help plan your lessons um, I truly want this to be a place where you can come to to help you plan your lessons um, to make it more interactive and to just to be able to find mentor texts and to really just understand what it is that you should be doing in the classroom so hopefully that is really going to help you guys okay so um, I want to start jumping in to some of the act some of the mentor text that I have selected for this anchor standard so let's take a look here on my iPad. Now, I will tell you guys, I have not done this many years where I, I've used my iPad as much as I've used it this year. This year, I use my iPad every single day. <laughs> Um, but one of the things that I started doing this year, and it's because how do you show a picture book to, you know, a whole group of kiddos that are all spread out in your room, they're not like in a circle. My kids can't get up out of their desk. They have to stay seated in their desks. So one of the things that I've been doing is I've been airplaying my iPad 
to my projector and I'm able to share a book off of my Kindle to my entire class. So all of the class can actually see the book versus me feeling like I'm walking around and being like winded from reading and walking at the same time. Guys, I don't know how those like singer celebrities do it because that's exhausting. <laughs> So let's talk about the type of text that I recommend for using um, for these standards. So one of the first ones that I really like are going to be the National Geographic books, which are here. Guys, look, it's my book. I, I bought it. <laughs> I bought my own Kindle version because um, I also wanted to see what it is. You want to see it? I haven't even opened it on this iPad. Um, there it is. I wrote that. I can't even believe it. All right, moving back. I'm going. Staying focused here. So one of the books that I really like using are going to be these National Geographic books. I think these are great. I think this is a level um, three. Let's look at this cover. Nope, it's a level two. But I know that they have level threes and I have definitely used that um, as well in my classroom. And level two is probably the youngest that I, the like the smaller text that I would go with my fourth and fifth graders. So this one's on mummies because why not? Uh, and I love it because they have so many great text features within this text that you can pull from. So you can see here, like it just has, it's so rich and it's images and the diagrams and the graphs, like it always, always has some form of a diagram inside of it. And so it, it allows for really great conversation to be made. Another one that I really like, and so I will recommend any of those, and you can pick those based off of your topics that you're t learning in science and social studies. I try to integrate as much as possible um, versus me just trying to pick, you know, a random one. Now, granted, we did not learn about mummies in science or social studies, so I went a little rogue on that one. Another one that I really like, and it's because of Ian. Ian got me into this one when he was in third grade. It's the Who Would Win series, and it's the hyena versus the honey badger. <laughs> I love this one. Um, and we have the Meet the Spotted Hyena, and it, again, it goes through some really great features here. And one of the really nice things about these texts that you can have conversations with kids is why are they choosing to include other animals? If the entire book is about the hyena versus the honey badger, you'll start to see that they have they show lots of different animals, but why does the author choose to show that? And you can have those conversations with kids. So like here, clearly they're talking about a hyena and a pack, but they also wanted to give some other type of group words so that you can have an idea that it's not just called a pack, it can be called a herd or a flock or a colony. And so they're sharing different animals that are in these groups, but they're just called something different. So kids are then able to start to build those connections that we talk about all the time that are so, so important. Um, so they also have uh, different geological graphs here. You can see all of those. They taught, they show the different types of dens. You can see the differences between them. Um, and it also shows how they chase. Like you can clearly see like here is, I think, what was this, the honey badger? And then this one was the hyena. Um, so all in all, really great opportunities for you to have conversations with your kids. Now, fun fact, I actually went on YouTube and I found a video because this is part of my bridging literacy units uh, for fourth grade. So this was integrated into, I want to say it was unit four for fourth grade. Um, but I found a video of a hyena and a honey badger that were fighting. Um, and so it was a great video because it's super short. It's about two or three minutes, but you see the fight itself and then you get to see who wins. So you have that two multimedia format that um you can have those it's conversations animated. what it's animated it's not animated oh really yeah it was a real fight he said it was an anim it's not animated it was a real fight guys so um you can go and find videos online of uh, different opportunities like that. So here's another one. I love Seymour Simon. He's one of my favorite informational um, authors. I will say his books are very, very long, but the photographs in them are 
they're stunning. I mean, they're just great. So now these don't necessarily have a ton of text features, but you can see the images and be able to pull information from these images. I know it does that. I always have to tap it for it to come back, but you can pull information from the images as well to have conversations about those. Um, and then of course you have other text that you can absolutely find. Bones is another recent favorite of mine. I really like this one because they show uh, the, they talk about the bones in a body of a human body, but then you can also make connections between the other bones that are occurring in other animals because they say, well, if we all have this many fingers, so do all the other animals, but they all just look a little bit different, but you still have the same number there. Now that doesn't happen all occasions, but they kind of give you some different examples here. So those are all gonna be some that I keep on my iPad. Let me show you all the other ones that I will use as far as text or articles. So those were picture books. So these are gonna be some articles. I really love Scope. Um, Scope and StoryWorks are going to be some that our school pays for us. And then I had some National Geographic as well that I've used in the past. All of these are wonderful for you to use inside of your classroom. Oh, look at that. That is gorgeous. Um, again, they all have really great text features that you can pull from them. Um, and then I have some that are marked here. So again, you have some great text features. You can see where they're kind of adding some of those captions. You have some different information down here. You have your graphs and it keeps going. And it has a lot of really engaging topics. So highly recommend it to become, to subscribe or see if you can use some of your um, school money to have these issues delivered to you. Okay, so those are gonna be the different types of text. I've used all of these with my students and they're really, really great. Now, what we're gonna talk about um, are going to be some of the activities that I have. Now, I have, one, two, three, four, five different activities for you. Now, some of these you're gonna be able to use for all three grade levels and others you may not. So you have to kind of base it off of the grade level that you have. When you are in the bridging literacy community, so my peeps who are already a part of the community, one of the things that I do wanna show you is going to be this little overview. So the overview is gonna be given to you blank so that you can fill it out if you choose to fill it out on your own as you're watching the videos. And then I will also give you one that is already filled out for you so that you can see the information that's in there. But I will have the standard for that grade level. You're gonna have a grade level uh, above it and then a grade level below it. I started to kind of dissect the information for you here. And then this is just like an overview so that you can compare where students are going to be coming in at and where should they be able to be ready to like leave at the end of the year. Um, but then I also take that same standard and then I break it down further. I give you your learning targets. I give you some assessment ideas. And then I also give you your learning tasks that you can do with that learning targets. Um, in the back, you're gonna see that there's titles, there's authors, there's gonna be text options that you can use there. And I do them for all of the grades, for fourth through sixth grade. So you're gonna see this, this is a sixth grade version. So there's some information there. These are not all the way done and I had to change, had a boo-boo there. Um, so here you can see, again, information that's being able to be pulled out. So all of this is gonna be given to you in the community itself. So let's jump in to some activities. And with the activities, one of the first ones that I will do, and this is typically my fourth grade activity, but I have these which are also part of my bridging literacy units, and I think this is fourth grade as well. The fourth grade, I'm sorry, fourth unit. Um, and then I cut these out. You can have them for kids to be able to access them and just be able to reference them as like just a reference tool. Um, but I cut these out and I have them in envelopes like this. And inside of the envelopes, they're all kind of pieced out. And then I put my kids into groups of maybe about three or four, depending on your class. And then they will have to match the um, type of text feature to the definition or the purpose of it and then also to the images. So which one is which? So you could say that, oh, that this is a map. And then I would have to look for, uh, make something easier. Where is this one at? I love how I don't even know. Oh, there it is. 
there it is, boom. And so they would match them all up. Um, and they would have to work together to figure them all out. And I loved this one because when I would do this activity, I would go around and I would do a quick check and then I would swipe the ones that were not correct. So if this one was not right, I'd swipe it from their list and I'd say, these are all wrong. And so it was like a, t like a timed thing where the kids were like pushing themselves to get all of them right before the other group. They loved it. It was always fun and engaging and they had really great conversations about them. Um, and then I just saved them from year to year. I stick them in an envelope and then I put them inside of a bin inside of my closet and then I can use them for the next year. Simple activity that you can do just to kind of give them that refresher. You can do it with any grade level. It's a great way to be able to hook your students quickly, to keep them engaged, to get them having conversations um, to, and to test their skills and seeing what they remember. Okay, so that's the first activity. The next activity is going to be one that I also really like. And I have two different versions here for you. So the first version, I took an article that I had found and I copied it and I pasted it into a Google Doc, okay? And so basically it was The Girl Who Lived Forever. This was a text that I had read with my fifth graders. And so as you can see, it has the image there. It has all of the um, captions for that image and it's in the spot that it belongs to in the text itself. Now, I didn't give my kids this one to begin with. So what I do is I will give them the text like this. So they will have this text and then they will read through it, but there's absolutely no images whatsoever. And I tried to break it to where I had the um, headers at the beginning of each page. So then, because I would have kids who would spread these pages out um, after they read it in their groups, and then they would have conversations about it. So here's how I would do this activity to the first time. Have them read this independently. Okay, once they've read it independently, you're going to put them into groups. When you put them into groups, you're going to ask them, I want you to have a conversation about what you just read. Um, go through, point to specific details in the text that you found really interesting, that you had a question about, and have that conversation with your students. You can use literature circle jobs um, that I shared back when I did my end of the year activities. Those would be really great. I love lit circle jobs. They're fantastic. Um, and then I would tell them now what's going to happen is after you've read this with your members, you are then going to take the images that are given in an envelope or either, you know, paper clip together. So here are the images and you're going to tell them, I want you to figure out where you would put this. So this activity is all about trying to figure out where the image would go within the text. What part of the text does it fit with? and why they think it fits with that part of the text. Oh, it's so challenging, but it's such a great, great opportunity to get kids thinking higher level. And they really start to kind of pinpoint, oh, well, if they're talking, let me kind of go through, if we're in the very beginning, just learning about, and they're talking about this terrifying regime, well, oh my gosh, it could be this part right here. Because here they're showing us um, the areas that were controlled and occupied. Um, and then you can start to kind of, oops, so it actually was this one, this piece there. And then here is this one. But they could have all of these conversations about which, what part or what part of the page um, these different text uh, features will belong. Now, so this is one version. It's not fancy, guys. I'm told, I told you, I'm not a fancy teacher. Um, I do things very basic. And here's my next very basic thing. <laughs> so I took one of the uh, articles from my, I think it was this one right here, Day of Disaster, um, which is a great text about coal mines. Um, and so I took this text, I scanned it on a printer, and then I cut it out without the images. And so I put them onto pages. I can number these if you wanna number them. But again, it's just another way for you to be able to take a text and be able to pull it apart from its images and to then match up where they think all of these different 
uh, images belong with that text. It's just a different look. One of them was a Google Doc. This one is from an actual article that I had to copy and cut and paste onto color cardstock, but it worked. Um, and you can do this with different text. So like, let's say you have five or six different groups and each of those groups might have a separate text that they're working with. Um, and if you wanna give them more opportunities, you can leave these texts out either in a Ziploc bag or a nice little envelope if you choose to do something fancier. And then as kids have extra time, if they want an opportunity to go back and see if they can do this with another text, they have that opportunity to go and do that during their independent time. So it's just something else that you can use for your groups, but then turn it around and put it for independent pieces to help keep that engagement going, but also give kids more opportunities to practice. Okay, so that was the second one. The next one that I have for you is going to be a caption creation. So caption creation, you can do this a number of different ways. So one of them is to just take an image. Um, I took these from my Kindle and I screenshot it and I cropped it down and then I put it into a Google Doc. That's literally all I did. So on my Kindle, screenshot it and then cropped it and put it on there. And then I have a spot here where the kids would have a caption creation. Now, I like this, not the one that I use. So here's how I do it. I end up taking images like this, again, screenshot, print it, all of these are from my iPad, and then I will put these onto chart paper. And so once I put them onto chart paper, each student could go around with a set of sticky notes, create their own caption, or they could just write it directly onto the chart paper if you have only one group and you don't, you know, you can use the sticky notes if you have multiple groups that you're meeting with during a day, like two or three different cohorts. Um, but if you're only meeting with one, have them write directly on the chart paper and they'll create their own captions. And everybody can kind of go around and look. You can then take it another step. So once everybody has their captions and they've walked around quietly, it's just like a quiet carousel, they've walked around, they've added the captions that they think they would put for these. You can then have students go back through and they could put a tally mark next to the caption that they would vote for for that image. So like, let's say that there's this one and there's probably, you know, like, seven or eight really good ones, I'm gonna put a tally mark next to the one that's my favorite. The one that has the most tally marks at the very end of it wins for that image. And then you can display that um, inside of your classroom or out in the hallway, and it's just another really great way to get kids excited and engaged and understanding the purpose for how that image goes along with the text or the information that's being interpreted from the image itself. So they're really having to read the images. Um, and who ever said that fourth, fifth, and sixth graders cannot read pictures because they still do it with text features. So caption creation, very, very simple, but also an exciting, engaging activity. Okay, so the next one that I have for you is going to be the one that is all about racing against the, against the clock. Uh, and when we race against the clock, this is the quickly and efficiently piece when we're thinking about fifth grade and being able to pull information quickly and efficiently. So in this text, which is from a StoryWorks article, we're looking at the pigeon hero of World War I. <laughs> um, look at that pigeon, how cute. I don't like pigeons, but this pigeon's super cute when it's like an image on paper. Um, but you can have students not necessarily read it, but they're just then gonna pull the information. You can put them into groups. I have little colorful buzzards that I will give each of my groups, and so they are going to to be racing against the clock to be able to find the information. So you could do it with the buzzard or you can have it to where everybody can gain a point if they have it during that time. So another easy way to do this is to have whiteboards. Um, one person can write, so everybody has to have an opportunity to write. So once I do a question, I'm gonna pass it to the person that's in my group and they're gonna write the answer down. Make sure everybody has a hand to the pen uh, versus just one person doing all the work because you don't want that. Um, and they will then pull the information out 
against the, the the clock that you put up, I will typically put up either one or two minutes depending on the text itself. And then I'll ask different questions. So a question could be on here is who was the U.S. Um, who were who were the allies of the U.S. during World War One? So they would have to find the text feature within this this article and pull that out. I could also say what other animals are used to help in warfare, and they would have to pull that information out. By the way, I did not know that. <laughs> I did not know this piece and this ties into another example that I have for you in a little bit. But uh, you could also say what uh, what role did the pigeon play in World War One, and they would have to find it from this part of the text. They would write that down super quick. So you can use any time, time frame that you would like to use. Again, it's all about pulling out information as quickly and efficiently as possible. So very easy on that one. Uh, it's just a little game activity. All you have to have prepared are articles for each of your groups, a whiteboard for them, and then also have a set of questions that you are going to be asking throughout. Okay, so uh, the next thing that we have are, and this is actually my final one, and it's kind of tied to this article because when I saw that, I was like, oh no, really? That's so interesting. So then it led me to go and start looking, looking things up online. <laughs> so here it says that uh, dolphins have been trained to locate underwater explosives. Oh my gosh. Um, so dolphins are really smart creatures, aren't they? Um, here's what you could do. This is going to be a carousel around the world to be able to pull information from. Now for sixth grade, when you're pulling information, you need to incorporate a variety of media. And so here's what I did. I just did QR codes. Now, if you can't, if you don't have a device for every single one of your students, you might need to have uh, computers or iPads at one of the stations, but you would have several of these stations. And your students would then go around to the stations to pull information from them. So I have dolphin defense, I have dolphins role in warfare, and then I have a video on dolphins brains. So they're pulling all of this information from these texts. Um, they're placing it on a very simple graphic organizer like this, which is kind of, you know, here's the question, here's the source, here's the information that you're pulling from it, and here's kind of what you can overall be able to write and articulate um, for your understanding of that question. So they would go around in their groups and they would just simply either watch the video, read the text that you have, different articles that you might have, pull that information, um, and then at the end of the day, be able to kind of share their thinking on their graphic organizers. Again, very simple. I really, really, really love group work. I cannot articulate how much I love a good group um, project. And it can be something very simple that's not extended to multiple days. I just think it's incredibly valuable to get kids talking and working with one another. It always keeps them engaged. So as much as possible, if I can get my kids working together and doing things together, these always work out great. Another thing that I ended up finding, um, and I wanted to point your attention to this because I thought it was interesting, but always kind of tag these things um, and write these things down. So one of the things that could be done here on the back of this page is as you find these, you can add your titles, text, locations, like where did you find it? Um, either the library or your library, and you could put other information here just to kind of help keep track of all of these sources because there's so many great things. But when I started looking at this and I started seeing this information about this pigeon, another thing that came up in this um, article from Scope, which is Lost in the Woods, is this. Look at how this dog has gone to really help um, be able to save someone. So you can talk about the connections that you see within the two different texts with the pigeons and now the dogs um, and their service that animals are providing in so many different ways. So it can lead to uh, so many different conversations and I think it's it's just great to be able to make these connections between multiple types of texts. Um, okay, so at this point, that is really going to be it. Um, just to kind of recap, what we've done today is we've gone over Anchor 7 for informational and we've looked at the vertical alignment between 4th, 5th, and 6th grade. So vertical alignment is just fancy way of saying we're looking at the differences of how it's progressing through those three grade levels. 
We've also looked and identified learning targets for them so to help us build our lessons. We've looked at mentor text that we could use to help teach this standard. And then we've also identified some activities to help make it a little bit more engaging. So it's not just a I'm just sitting here talking to you and you're just going to end up writing at the end of the day. We want to make it fun and exciting and we want to get kids talking with one another. As a reminder, okay, I know I've said this a lot, but this is the last time I'm going to say it for a little bit. Um, this live chat is going to be the final one that I provide in the Unpacking Anchors series. In order to receive access to all of the other anchors for literature informational that is one through nine, literature doesn't have a standard or an anchor eight, so we don't include that one. And we don't include 10, which is basically reading and comprehend, like reading a grade level text. I don't include that one. But we also do that, we look at anchors one, two, and three for writing, which are going to be the three main forms of writing that we are dissecting. And then maybe we'll start looking at some of the other ones if this ends up re uh, working really well for all of the community members out there and supporting you guys. So if you want to receive access to all of this information, the templates, um, the unpacking pages where I go through and dissect everything for you, the list of all of the mentor texts for each of these anchors, I highly recommend to join the Bridging Literacy community. All of this is going to be available throughout the summer and at the very beginning of the school year. So these videos are going to be coming out. We have a private Facebook group where we're going to do a live Q&A once a month. And then I'm going to have sprinkled in there some professional development to help support you guys in how to build lessons and how to incorporate Bridging Literacy and where do you kind of go from here to help make your year less stressful next year. We don't want you to be stressed. We want you to feel confident, good, and we want you to enjoy your free time at the end of the day and not spending it either grading or planning out your lessons. All of this is to help support you. Now, I have some news really quick. So there's going to be 20 of these? In the yes, 20. All 20 are going to be available in the Bridging Literacy released community. Throughout the summer. And it's released throughout the summer, yes. Uh, but I also have some other news. This is going to be the final live chat for quite some time. Uh, we are not going to have another live chat on YouTube until July the 18th is what we have decided. July the 18th, just in time for going back to school. We'll do some back to school um, live chats, but we're going to go back to doing just normal video for just a little bit. I'm going to be spending a lot of time in the Facebook for bridging our private Facebook group for bridging literacy community. And I'm going to do so many more lives with all of you there um, that are strategic and specific to what you all need in that community. So I hope that you guys enjoyed this. Do you have any questions? Did I miss anything? How much time do you uh, in your reading block for whole group lessons? I have an hour right now to teach reading, writing, grammar, vocabulary, all of it. I have an hour. So I think you should kind of break that down between COVID time and yes. before Yes. So, so COVID time, I have an hour. Before COVID, I had an hour and maybe 10, 15-ish minutes. Um, so it wasn't that big of a difference, to be honest, because we in our Mac team spent a huge focus on um, project based learning. And so we have a pretty good content time. And so we wanted to make sure that we were not, you know, spending too much time on other things and we were integrating and incorporating everything into our, our PBLs. So we only have about an hour, 10 hour, 15 ish minutes for ELA pre COVID. Um, and I, we came up with Bridging Literacy to help solve this issue of not having enough time to teach everything, but also how do we integrate it to make it authentic, to make it purposeful, meaningful for our students, and, and not having it feel so disjointed. So Bridging Literacy's entire focus is to help take all of the things that we have to teach in ELA, and we integrate it into this very beautiful and scaffolded and seamless a progression for how you teach your lessons. It helps you helps your students make connections between reading and writing and it allows you to have a much clearer focus of what's expected of you and of your students at the end of each unit. But you don't spend an hour in whole group. No, I don't spend an hour in whole group. I, I'm not sure if that's how the question was. It says how much time do you have in your reading block for I recommend um, for any lesson you go about 15 minutes. 
15 minutes is what I would say for any lesson, whether it's whole group or small group. Um, it's going to be a 15 minute lesson. Now, if you're throwing in some of these activities, you have to be very purposeful and have everything ready to go. Um, I put things in buckets. I have things labeled. They're already out. Like it's like clockwork. So we spend a lot of time at the very beginning of the year getting used to these procedures and the things that I will do all year long so that it doesn't take me forever to do an activity like this in my class. It's not a separate reading block for a guided reading. No. So I don't have guided reading um, in upper elementary. And to be honest, I personally don't do a lot of guided reading in upper elementary. I focus more on skills. We're looking more at what are we doing with the text that we're reading versus teaching them how to read. I will have probably I normally in a year will have one guided reading group and it's because they are my low, lower level learners who need time just learning how to read. Um, and so I will have one guided reading group and then all the other ones are more skills based. Is that good? Yeah. All right. So. I have a 14 year old that we have to go and pick up from my in-laws. <laughs> Um, I really hope that you guys take some time, um, either for those of you that are currently in the chat that are watching or those of you that are re kind of seeing this a little bit later on, you have until June 4th at 1159 p.m. to join the Bridging Literacy community. Um, this is something that I am very passionate about and it is truly a way for me to be able to serve you as teachers to help make things easier. Um, I've spent many years trying to figure that out myself and I think I finally found the sweet spot. Um, and it's with the bridging literacy method, but it's also with so many other things that are kind of combined. Um, and the reason I say that is because you kind of have to think of it as a curriculum. There's not a single curriculum out there that's going to fit the needs of everyone. Um, and so there's not one single thing that you can do to really make teaching literacy easier. There's so many different like elements and components that you really have to think about. And so bridging literacy is not only going to be something that helps save you time, that helps make planning easier easier, that helps make your units easier, it helps make you understand everything so much better, but it's also going to be a way for you to just feel less stressed at the end of the day. Um, it's going to make you feel as though you're hitting everything that you need to hit by the end of the year, um, but also feeling as though you're making it meaningful and exciting and fun for your students and you're helping them to see those connections in the long run because that's the important part. We want to make them critical thinkers. We want to make them enjoy reading. Um, but at the end of the day, we also want just, you know, to have fun in reading and writing because a lot of kids don't like reading and writing. And so we're trying to bring that fun back for them. So um, you can go and check out the community by heading to abridgingliteracy.com. Um, you can click on the price, plans and pricing there to view the monthly or the annual prices for it. Again, you get access to a private uh, Facebook group. You're going to have access to all of the 20 videos for Anchor Standards and much more that's going to be coming a little bit later on. So lots of things planned for the community and I'm very excited about it. This is our last live for a little bit. July 18th. We'll be back. Uh, but I hope that you guys enjoy some of the other videos that I will be putting out on Sunday mornings. Um, I will see you there in those comments. So be feel free to chat me up in the comments. If you have any questions, you can DM me over on Instagram for the lettered classroom um, or on my Facebook, which is also for the lettered classroom. Uh, happy to answer, answer anything that you guys might have. So BLC members join the Facebook group. Yes, if you're a BLC member already, please make sure that you join the Facebook group. So the plan will be that um, on the 5th or yeah, the 5th of June, um, I will put a time out on the Facebook group, but we are going to do a live chat to welcome all of the new members. We've had quite a few new members join us this past week, um, but we want to welcome all the new members. I'm going to have a special giveaway for you guys, and then we're also going to chat about what things are going to look like for the next couple of months in the Bridging Literacy community. So very very excited um and i cannot wait to hang out with all of you and to get you all to get to know you all a little bit better in that facebook group so um all right guys so i'm gonna go ahead and end it here thank you so much for joining me i know you're tired you got this 
just keep going a little bit longer. You'll be able to rest and relax very, very soon. Um, and I'm right there with you. I'll be at my classroom tomorrow morning, exhausted, probably having another cup of coffee <laughs> just to make it through the day. But we got this. You can do it. Um, and I hope to see you over in the community. Bye, everyone.